Hey, Steve here. As always, this episode of BJJ Mental Models is brought to you by BJJ Mental Models Premium. Check it out at premium.bjjmentalmodels.com. If you like the public podcast feed here, there's a ton more stuff there for you. If you want to support the show and help keep the lights on, signing up for premium is the way to do it. There's tons of strategic courseware content there, as well as access to our awesome community. And black belts like myself are more than happy to review your rolling footage if you're a member of Premium. So please do consider it premium.bjjmentalmodels.com. Again, that's premium.bjjmentalmodels.com. Thanks again, and as always, enjoy the show. Hey, welcome to BJJ Mental Models, episode 140. I'm Steve Kwan. BJJ Mental Models is your guide to a conceptual and intelligent jiu-jitsu approach. And today, back with returning champion from Estonia, Preet Mikkelsen. Preet, how are you doing? So far, so good. Busier than usual, but it's good. (laughs) Yeah, I was going to say, you you had a busy few days from what I understand. Congratulations on the little one. Yeah, thank you, thank you. So it's yeah, it's been you know a little bit less less sleep than usual, but <laughs> it's man- it's manageable. Yeah, I I remember that first few months when I had when we had our kid, and it was just a like a constant barrage of confusion and lack of sleep, and just always being tired. But definitely worth it at the end of the day. So congratulations to you and your family. Thank you. Right, I have a, I have a lot of help also. My her her he, she has sisters, you know, and my mother and father. I have my mom, so they all live they all live pretty close to us. So, so it's it makes it easier a bit when you have support. So it's they can you know take shifts and we can sleep during the day. And so it's it's not all that bad, but yeah, it it takes a toll on you. <laughs> well, I will I will try to make this brief and easy. Then recording that you and I wanted to do for quite a while, and I think probably will be quite helpful is to talk about the various systems that you've got. So I think most people who listen to this probably know who you are. Um, You know, you've been on the podcast many times before, but I know that the main thing that you're working on these days is your defensive BJJ framework, which is a subscription site. I think most of our uh, paid subscribers are also on your site at this point. The community crossover seems to be pretty high. So I, I definitely recommend if you have even a passing interest at making your defense at jiu-jitsu a bit stronger. I highly recommend checking out Preet's framework and checking out his site. But one of the questions that often comes up, Preet, you're in our community Discord and you spend a lot of time there fielding questions and a lot of them seem to be kind of repeats of the same thing, all coming down to what is this? Why are we doing this? How is this different from what we already do? And, you know, you and I were talking and we thought we could probably actually add some value if we just recorded a conversation explaining all of this and answering these questions so that if anyone wants to understand the defensive BJJ framework, they've got a reference point they can go to get started. Yep. Cool. 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 All right. So I guess the first thing, Preet, let's talk about your your history here. I mean, you came onto my radar and the radar of probably most people with some of your early work with BJJ Fanatics. But what you did there was very kind of specific and targeted. I mean, you had a few instructionals like the Grilled Chicken Instructional, which are intended to solve very specific positional problems. But something that you mentioned to me recently is that a lot of the positions that you play are actually intended to be played together and actually are not really that different. They're just the same thing from different angles. So I'd love to maybe explore this a little bit. Would you be able to quickly explain just how all of these positions fit together and what they look like? So if someone is playing (laughs) your defensive system, I mean, I know it's a loaded question, but what are some of the main positions and how do they chain together? So we let's say so far we have, I would call it four and a half. We have four crunches, crunching positions and one extension. So baby bridge being extension. So we have a hawking, running man, turtle, and let's say panda, and of course, open guard, crew chicken. So they're all, I would call it without any you know explanation of visual, they're all crunched. But it's the system is also involved in that sense. But let's say if you imagine turtle, turtle is jiu-jitsu position, that, mm, that would be like a, 
base idea of it that you seal feet, your knees are wide, your head is on a mat, and your elbows are tucked to your ex- uh, hip flexors. Yeah, you don't put your elbows on a mat, so to speak, that uh, very tucked in. So this seems to be like, some people call it like egg or something. Uh, this seems to be like a, like a nice idea that works. And if you flip it, like we call it turtle, you know, more exact would be tortoise. You know, it's a land animal in that, in that sense. But it's kind of, it would be very hard to like uh, push it. Like now it's tortoise guard, tor- tortoise escapes. Turtle is what is accepted. And so we go with turtle. But then if you flip it around, like a turtle on his back, then it becomes like open guard situation when, and this structure is everywhere. Watch Mikey Musumeki, watch uh, what Lachlan is doing, watch Keenan's guard, uh, watch uh, Mendes brothers. It's like, you know, knees pulled in a little bit wide and really like a safe structure that you don't expose your armpits and that kind of oblique area. And people defend from there. Mio brothers example also. They defend from there and they, they shoot from there to different guards. But it's uh, the structure. If you watch how they keep the guard, it's that structure. And uh, so, but if you, let's say, if you sit up the, that structure, yeah, first it's a guard, so to speak, on his back. But then if you sit it up, it becomes a butterfly guard. But it's exactly the same position in that sense. Your head is forward, for, your head is forward the hips. In an essential, in a very fundamental way, your elbows are tucked. If it's a butterfly guard, you probably look towards opponent. But then the opposite of this is the opponent can be behind you in the same position, but behind you. And so we call it the panda because, you know, there's a panda pictures all over the internet when pandas are eating, they're kind of slouching like this. So just somebody named it as a panda. I, I call it also like a sitting turtle or also like upright side control. So just butterfly guard, but they're like not on one hip butterfly guard, but both cheeks on the mat butterfly guard, but then they're behind you and you tuck your head. You kind of hang your head and your elbows are really in a hip flexor area again, and you're protecting your neck and your underhook area. So that's, those are like a visual that they're pretty same, like turtle that on their back, the, some call it supine, supine guard, supine guard, and then, you know, sitting up. And then there's a uh, twisting things. Uh, that's really interesting because we have a running man. It's, you know, borrowed from Saul, I guess, the name. I know John Will, I think, Australian guy, calls it like a, what's a half turtle or something. That it's kind of visual. It's hard to, hard to explain. Would be like more like um, your chest is 45 degrees close to the mat, towards the mat. And your legs are in a position that they're kind of like running. And in my explanation that top side is has to be short tucked and the bottom side has to be extended and basically the hawking would be you flip the running man upside down and then it becomes like a position you can play when your back is more towards the mat you want it or not but you have to have it so to speak and the baby bridge would be the extension of this usually with the hawking and stuff you think about like baby bridge being extension like a sprawl is an extension in a top but baby bridge is an extension from the bottom and it's a sideways kind of very minimal bridge when your hip is on a mat. So there's a bigger bridge and the baby bridge is also, if you're a parent, uh, then you can ex- you can see that how babies turn around in the first couple of months, you know, they start to flip themselves and so they bridge, uh, the hip is on a mat, they bridge and they go belly down. So that's why it's a baby bridge also. And uh, we call it baby bridge because it's the lowest hip position bridge because you're basically arching, but your hip is on the mat. So you're arching kind of sideways. And uh, so seems like with those positions so far, we can, no, if I go, and uh, again, I, I try to stay away from absolutes, but if it slips, then, you know, people can uh, forgive me, but they, they seems to answer my, most things, if not all uh, position wise. Let's say if uh, I, I can honestly say that what comes to, let's say being back towards the mat, I can explain everything what's going to happen defensively using Hawking and Baby Rich as a structure away from opponent or towards opponent like facing. So, so that's kind of like, um, they're, they're separate positions. Uh, in that sense, we can definitely separate, like, you know, in the Jiu Jitsu, we, we can separate white, uh, white and blue and purple belts, but there's a clear distinction, uh, between those belts that what they are. So we can clearly distinct towards those positions that there's, they're standing alone. But also they're all connected to each other, and basically how how I teach it is I I treat them like trenches that you can be safe in, survive in, 
And uh, then from there, you look for escapes, for opportunities, because they, they make the person to overcommit. And that's telegraph- telegraphing their attention. So it, you can find easier, easier ways out. And then the sport plays out and somebody wins, somebody loses. But they're all connected also. So in that sense, uh, I, I always teach them like a static positions. Then I teach the transitions between all of them to all of them, kind of connect everything to everything. And then I usually say never stop. Even like a fun one centimeter an hour, you just always move. And, uh, you know, if you watch, let's say just... Not that he does everything according to my knowledge, but let's say Jeff Clover or whatever, if you see him scrambling, moving around, he never stops. And I can, I can teach that basically. And, but it's very hard to teach, you know, if you watch Jeff Clover, it's very, very hard to distinguish what he does. So I kind of broke everything down to different trenches that we can distinguish and then teach them separately and then put them back together. And then let's say even Jeff Clover's game makes sense to me. I can, I can, you know, shifer, like the shifer, what's the word? Like, you know, like a safe, I can open it, so to speak. I can understand what it does and why everything works. So that's basically without any visual, maybe, you know, I can explain it this way. Perfect. And that makes sense to me. I mean, if people have never seen or checked out your work before, I can understand that this might seem a little bit overwhelming. So I'll try to maybe follow up here and walk through my process of how I started to understand your work. So something on the podcast that our listeners will recall that I talk about a lot is the idea of limb coiling, which is that unless you've got a really good reason and unless you can do it safely, by default, you want to tuck your elbows, tuck your knees, tuck your neck. You don't want to leave anything dangling that could get injured. Probably one of the most common listener questions I get people writing in at is they're saying something to the effect of, you know, I'm I'm a two month white belt and I've been injured 20 times already. What's going on? (laughs) And usually my number one piece of advice to people is be very conscious about where you leave your arms and your legs and your neck, because the problem that a lot of white belts make, especially and even blue and purple belts, is they're not thinking about this. They're just kind of flailing and scrambling and they'll throw their whole body in one direction but they'll leave their leg behind. And that's how you get an injury is when one of your legs is dangling and it gets twisted and put out of position. So the reason I talk so much about this this concept is because it's very good, not just for defensive jujitsu, because it prevents your opponent from grabbing and latching onto a lever, but it also keeps you safe. And so I like the way that you're talking about crunching positions, because that's basically the same thing. You're talking about retracting everything to be more defensive and more safe. And this is a good practice for people, especially early on. I, it's funny, I was talking to my brother, Matt, the other day, and we were talking about how, you know, when you think about it, most of the things in jiu-jitsu that we consider fundamentals that we were all taught from the beginning, there's really nothing fundamental about them. They're just a bag of techniques that a bunch of Gracies decided decades ago that these are the things that we should call fundamentals. I mean, I remember when I started jiu-jitsu, one of the first things they taught me was, you know, the pendulum sweep and the scissor sweep. You're never going to hit those. You're, you're just not. No, no one who's any good is going to let you do a pendulum sweep on them. And I wish that that time and attention had been better focused on body positioning, like what you're talking about, which is crunching yourself in. So when you broke down your positions, you kind of explained them into two broad categories. You've got crunches, which would be, I mean, turtle is the most obvious example. But if you flip the turtle upside down, you get butterfly guard. There's also variations you can do. I mean, I kind of play a sideways turtle when I'm sort of like a fetal position, honestly. And of course, grilled chicken is sort of an example of where you're crunched in as well. And you've also described twisting positions like running man and like hawking. And we can get into those a bit. And the one thing that really stood out to me and what really made your system click for me was when you said that actually these positions are all just variations of basically the same thing. When I first got exposed to your work, my first thought was, why are there all of these weird positions with weird names and how am I going to remember them? But something that you told me was, look, there's really only two positions. There's the crunch position and there's the twist position. And depending on the angle of your body, you might call that running man or hawking or whatever. But basically, it's the same general idea. And I think that's a really helpful way, especially for beginners, to think about a system. There's really only two fundamental positions that your body needs to be in if you're playing the Preet Mikkelsen defensive jiu-jitsu system. You're either crunched or you're twisted. Is that a 
fair explanation of what you do? I guess. Also, you said you play turtle like kind of sideways. So that is also, I think, the change. Uh, we'll see if it's uh, something you do, but in, in a sounds like similar thing. So this is what also I'm going to change or add to the turtle soon. That uh, kind of like a I know, kind of like a ru- running man on his elbow and facing yes. opponent. So uh, we're going to have that because uh, the neutral stances have their advantages and disadvantages. Let's say you can play grilled chicken supine guard, like on your back, you know, you can play it very neutral and are you like flat on your back, so to speak? And you're, you know, kind of like a bo- left and right are equal sides. But you see many times also people play it, the, the grilled chicken stuff, open guard, like a little bit on one side because it kills the leg drags, the leg locks are gone and everything else. And it's easy to sit up to uh, you know, a butterfly guard on one cheek and everything else. Like, a, so it's the sideways gives you more kind of more options. The, the neutral one is good for something, but uh, the sideways one are giving you certain like mobility that kind of neutral ones are more exposed to certain like left and right attacks too easily, but you still have to have them. And then, uh, so that's why I'm trying to change also turtle because it works already so good, but as a, as a defensive structure, if you want to attack and stuff, then if you do any wrestling attack, you have to be a little bit like, uh, you know, sideways to opponent. And let's say on a, on, a, on a straight arm post or elbow post, so you can reach with the front arm around, you know, their waist or the, around their legs and stuff. Uh, you see wrestlers many times in NCAA, they have like a, let's say, knee on a mat and the same side arm on a mat and they're reaching with a with the other arm and, you know, they're like looking for stuff. So uh, it's uh, more sideways, more attacking, so to speak. But it comes with a price of being also more open. So I like the neutrality yeah. because it's very, very dead, so to speak. And it's very passive, so it helps you to survive most things. But then I guess the balance, you know, like a boxer, yeah, you can have a neutral stance, like feet parallel, but you can stay away and it's very safe. But to actually gain advantage and to punch people, most boxers, boxing right away develops one side forward because it's it's an equal opportunity of defense and attack from there. So super defensively, you would mo- maybe use other stuff because if you would be neutral stance, probably... You you have an easier time maybe I don't know checking leg kicks outside or something, so you know uh, some parallels with that. So neutral and uh, let, let's say parallel and staggered stance. So Hawkins and running men's they're more staggered. So I guess I see mistakes and stuff, but in a way I agree with you that let's say neutral the crunch and then you have like a crunch twist, and that means like one side is more crunched, one side is more extended. So. Yeah, and then I guess people, if if they they hear that, they have to I'm gonna see my work, and then it makes sense because in my in my YouTube channel, I guess we have the video about the introduction to defensive BJ, so they can reference that, and it all makes more sense if they watch that introduction first. Yeah, I'll put a link to that in the show notes because I yeah. fully understand that some of this stuff is probably a little bit hard to visualize. I suspect that a good percentage of our listeners have probably seen these positions before from your instruction but have just there will always be some though who just they have no idea what we're talking about so i'll I'll put a link there to that intro video just so that people can visualize it now i think that the crunch positions like turtle and uh you know grilled chicken i think that these are positions that most people would consider non-controversial i mean you see people play these positions all the time no one's going to say that turtle is a controversial position well actually maybe that's not true people always give me trouble for playing turtle but but people will accept that turtle is a real position and grilled chicken i've seen danaher's guys play grilled chicken it's not a controversial thing but the twisting guards are the place where i think a lot of people have a lot of questions so the where this came onto my radar was your your hawking material, especially the hawking 2.0 stuff you've done. And for those who haven't seen it, I guess probably the easiest way to explain it is it's a type of side control that you can play. It's a variant of side control, except the main difference is you have a bit of twist in your spine when you're doing it. And you can either play it facing your opponent or you can play it facing away if you get forced into that position to some degree. So it's a very interesting and unique variant because normally 
with side control, when you're on the bottom, your objective is to try to keep your spine all totally aligned. But hawking is a little bit different because often your upper body will be turned to a slightly different angle than your lower body. So, Preet, I'd love to dig a little bit deeper into this because I know this is one of your newer inventions. From from your perspective, what's the history of hawking and how this came about? <laughs> what what problem came up where you had to solve this? Because I, I've been following you on Facebook and I've seen it. It's actually really interesting. It's like watching a scientist do lab work in real time. I've seen videos of you like actually making this stuff and, and, and testing it out on the fly. I would love to know what was the what was the moment where you realized, OK, there's a problem I have to solve. And how does hawking solve that problem? Okay, first of all, I don't want to maybe go there deeper right now, but the alignment stuff, I guess, have to also be explained later or, or uh, because I don't think that aligned means, I understand when you lift weights and stuff that you have to be aligned because you have to lift heavy weights and stuff. But I think in jujitsu, it's, it's a little bit different. But anyway, so that, you know, people usually mean that align, oh, your elbows are in front of you, your head is straight and you're aligned on your back and this is aligned. But because uh, jiu-jitsu has multi-directional force, for me, it's like if you want to lift a barbell, but you have uh, wind blowing from your left uh, to the legs and other wind blowing to the right from to the head, and, and then you have to manage lifting something up, your structure will be different against uh, the alignment will be different because you have to balance different things. But anyway, so that's, I'm trying to also understand alignment stuff because I clearly understand what people mean about it. But I think in jiu-jitsu, it, it works differently because the the forces are different but uh, what hawking hawking was anyway the the simple story is i taught i taught a lot of uh, traditional stuff i guess you know that we start uh, escaping people had cross face underhook and you had your neck frame you know you had your hip frame and uh, when people don't squeeze much then uh, you know the bridge and shrimp whatever they teach you know bridge towards opponent and then shrimp and get to the guard kind of works but then as soon as the top guy is allowed to squeeze super hard and then nothing works, let's say, yeah, it's super hard to do bridge and shrimp if they're allowed to really, really like destroy you. And then most people will not stay on the knees. Also, they do like a scarf hold with the hips a little bit. So they, they, they kill it, you know, they'll be heavier. And right away, there's like technique don't work. And, you know, I've given some stupid answers to people that just try harder and stuff. But I was always annoyed by it. But why do we start from there, you know? That, that why do we give already like a you know cr- good cross face that kind of forces your head to turn away and then it's hard to bridge towards people and why do we give them underhook because in wrestling when you do like a beginner class like literally nobody knows wrestling and the first class probably everybody does keep your elbows close and fight for underhooks like it's your life depends on it and then in jiu-jitsu we start like a, in a in a stupidest pinning position cross face underhook it's a pin, it's considered a pin. And then we started escaping from the pins that should be very hard to escape. So what's, it doesn't, it didn't make sense. And also what threw me off and I still, uh, tr- it f- does threw me, threw me off. And I don't, and when I talk to people about it, they haven't thought about it is let's say in a close guard top, you're basically what, what we agree on everybody that in close guard top, whatever the posture you use, let's say you grab lapel, one arm, one arm is on a hip, you grab the lapels and you stay there. Your objective is to kill everything early. Do not give them, take from them everything and give them nothing. Not like you're going to start with a high guard already or, you know, armpit, like a, a pit stop armbar position. And then you fight from there. No, you first teach beginners to be super safe, super early, to kill everything, and then you can do whatever opening you want. But then why then in side control, we give everything away and then teach them to escape. So why does, what can we do it also in side control? Just, okay, we're in that position, like we're in a close guard, we're forced to that position. But is there a way that we can stay there and not giving everything away that the top person needs to control. Like in a guard, they would need a overhook or underhook or, you know, something like this, but we're denying them that. So why in side control, it's like we're teaching people to be stupid and we're teaching them to like let top guy get to the pin and then we're pretending they can escape that. And clearly they can't in, you know, that in that efficiency rate that we actually tell them to. 
And uh, so that kind of threw me off. I was like, something's off. And why, why does not people ask those questions? Because for me, it was obvious. And then, then it started with a, the, you know, kind of the hawking name started because we were tucking our head, so to speak, that we were trying to not give people underhook. And so the underhook was very hard to dig. We're kind of forcing your head on a mat and square, like a crunching the one side that's facing them. And so even if they got the underhook, they couldn't get the good crossface. So everything was kind of like become more early, become more early. So, to, they, so they couldn't connect. And then also, I think I can throw in a mix. Maybe, maybe it somehow influenced me, but John Cavanaugh did like, uh, I think it was some kind of SPG summer camp somewhere. And he was doing that untappable thing that where he turned to more towards his side and was facing away from the opponent. He was calling it untappable. And I was like, hmm, interesting that you kind of almost turn your back. But, you know, he was claiming that it's hard to submit from there and da da da. So kind of like those ideas was, oh, it was okay. And then it was Saulo, Saulo's idea that Saulo Ribeiro was the DVD when he said he was doing a running man example. And he said like, but uh, he's just behind me. He's not, un- he's, he's not going to take my back. And it's, it's totally fine that he's behind me. So probably uh, but then I would, we were starting to turn away from uh, with a hawking opponent because uh, let's say if you face them, it's early. Uh, we can probably, uh, I'm not a, you know, I'm not arguing that facing them would be better, but also I, I don't want to be, I don't want to say better because I think it's, they're both good and they're both actually equally good and turning, facing them is not better because uh, facing them means you fight for the same space because they're coming in with a force and you, and you're turning in. So you meet them and you're fighting for the same space. So you have a harder time, but you have an earlier reaction. But if you face away, not like vertical, you know, shoulders vertical, top of each other, but in a way we promote that you, if you face away, then going away from them, you're not fighting for the same space because facing away, you have all the space you need. But the price is you have to show a little bit your back, you know, the back exposure. So, and then if you see like John Kavanaugh, and then if you see some evidence, good escapers, you know, like tellers and stuff, doing stuff and people can't take their back. So you start to wonder that, hmm, this is interesting. And then, you know, underhook denying that how that would work. And uh, so that's the main thing I usually roll people. I just said, don't give me underhooks. And uh, Jiu-Jitsu is terrible with that. And uh, just on side note is I also don't like how t- Jiu-Jitsu teaches underhooks, like from example, from side control escapes. I think it's terrible because you just get darst and um, omoplata mounted all the time because mostly it's, um, you know, not taught like a, like a wrestling I think wrestling underhook systems are way more functional, even in jiu-jitsu. They don't open you up for uh, omoplata mounts and knee and belly mounts and, and uh, you know, Dars is also example. So hawking kind of started from that, that I tried to give people a better answer that what to do when you're on your back. I guess you don't want to be there, but it still happens. We can see it. So you better know what to do. And... You know, I don't like usually when when I, I skip a little bit, like if, if I want, uh, you have a little turtle, uh, people always said, you know, the, the treat turtle as a transitional position. And now I know they're wrong in, in that sense, in the right context, if I say, because to, to escape really fast turtle, you have to be there the longest to have the best knowledge pool and experience to escape fast. So same becomes also when you're on your back. Of course, I want to escape the fastest. But if I want to escape the fastest, I want to make the best decision. So that means I have to be the, I have to have a biggest experience. So how do you gain the experience staying there? But then the question is, how do you stay there without getting mauled and armbarred? So then, okay, crossface, not being on the flat and don't give it underhooks. And they're like, game has evolved and it has taken me like 15 years because the Hawking 2.0 breakthrough happened last year in August. And then it finally clicked because I played also hawking away many, many years. But after, I also knew that there were some problems still, but because most people were not, so to speak, used to fighting with people that are turning away. So I had also a lot of success, but I was still always know that something was missing. And in August, we kind of figured it out. So, but it's taken me 15 years, but this is kind of the main story, I guess, that I wanted to solve that why we're starting 
like super pinned and then we're complaining side control escapes are hard it's like if you have a full arm full fully locked arm bar arm bar escapes are hard so but we're not teaching beginners to escape fully locked arm bars we try to teach them something earlier you know and so why not in side control so well, i wish people would see that uh, you know illogical thing that we're doing to people and i wish more people would start to you know, study that, and and that's my, I'm doing the my thing, and I think it's a pretty good system. But it's there's not many people who are doing that. So if you have hundred people that maybe come up with the same thing, then we know that we are correct, or maybe somebody discovers some 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 new way. So then we know that okay, there has to be some unifying thing. You know, like a, with the gravity and the quantum quantum physics, there has to be a unifying theory. So I would I would wish that there was be there were more systems around that we can compare. And uh, you know, build on. So that's uh, that's my rant at the moment. <laughs> well, very, very helpful. Thank you for sharing that. And you touched on a few things that I also advocate for as well. One of them is you talked about how we teach side control in a lot of ways from kind of the worst case scenario. And I sort of get that. You want to teach people to get out of the worst case scenario. So what happens is when instructors teach side control, they often instruct people, okay, give up the cross face, give up control of your arms. The person's going to smash you start from the worst case scenario. And the reason for that is because the whole point of jujitsu is to get out of the worst case scenario. I get that. But the problem is that you are what you train. If you're my instructor, Preet, and you teach me every day for years that side control is this position where you've got a cross face on me and you've got control of my arm, then subconsciously, I'm just going to gravitate towards that position because that's what I know and I'm comfortable with. Exactly. And you're not supposed to do that, right? There's no rule if, you ha- if you've given up side control. There's no rule saying that you need to let your opponent cross face you and grab your arm. And this is a huge mistake with the way that people train jujitsu. Same with attacking from the guard. The person on the top often just wanders aimlessly into the other person's guard and they just start from there because that's how we do things in practice. And you you are what you train. So what winds up happening is people completely bypass that whole phase of guard where you're fighting for grips and you're fighting for engagement and you're really doing the things that are going to guarantee you success. But no, people don't do that. They just wander right in. So one of the things I like about the hawking position, I've only tried it once in practice, but I see the the approach here and I see why you would do it, is really when you play that position, you immediately take away your opponent's ability to lock onto anything. It's Is it the most athletic position from the bottom? No, because your spine is a bit twisted, but it's very hard to grab anything. You're probably not going to get an arm. You're probably not going to get the neck. You're probably not going to get the legs. So if we condition people when their guard is being passed, rather than just giving up the cross face and and going to the side control position, if we condition people when your opponent is about to advance position, take away all of the things that they could attack. That's a good practice. Generally, you don't have to be doing hawking, but however you do jujitsu, if your opponent is advancing position, your goal should be immediately to start shoring up all of your defenses and not giving them anything at all to attack. Yeah, I, I actually I disagree with you on the hawking being not athletic, because and also the question is always athletic for what? Because let's say from hawking, I can depends where the weight is. If the weight is more upper body, I can pretty strongly. If I'm crunched and you know in a, in a way the hawking is, I can force myself to turtle pretty strongly. And if the weight is on my hip, I can start to sit up to up, you know, upright side control. And also hawking is, in a way, we haven't mentioned that, hawking is a minimal invert. That also, some for some people, it kind of makes sense and clicks, oh, I haven't thought about it. Because let's say if I don't, I don't agree that maybe being on your back, you know, and the typical, let's say, side control stuff would be more athletic. I think you're flat and anything you do, you have to turn, you know, sideways to do a bridge, whatever. So I don't, maybe we don't have to discuss it, you know, in this podcast, but I don't understand um, being not athletic because from the Hawking doing invert example, like a, like a guard retention stuff against Toronto from invert, from Hawking, it's actually nicely possible. And uh, so the alignment and athletics 
I would really have to like would want to talk about it, but maybe it's a like a should be a visual visual video or something that we can compare. Because again, I understand when you want to lift uh, the bar over your head, it's alignment. I understand, but if you playing sports, throwing discs, and uh, you know jumping over you know hurdles and stuff. Or even, you know, jumping with a long stick and going over. So there's different body positions there that seems to be not so athletic, so to speak, because they're all, you know, not aligned. So I kind of let people kind of in the, in the spot that, oh, it's not, not athletic. You're not strong there because I don't know how to explain it with athleticism and stuff, but I don't think I'm weak there. I'm actually quite strong. And for a top person to break it, they have to, really, really overextend them and use overcommitment forces that will expose their intent that I can use it against them. So it's a really interesting topic in that sense that why is the Hawking, you know, athletic, why I'm strong there and how alignment theory kind of connects to it. I know we had an argument already and we kind of fixed it because it was about the head and stuff. And I understand also then uh, the spine twisting thing and why maybe it's considered, you know, non-athletic, so to speak. But maybe it's a talk for another, you know, another podcast or it's a really interesting discussion in that sense. So I just wanted to say that. Yeah, I'll actually maybe explain it here a little bit because I know that this is one of the things that often comes up when people see the Hawking framework. There seems to be a large crossover of people who are into both your framework and also into Rob Bernanke's stuff. And Rob Bernanke's main thing, the thing he's probably best known for is talking about alignment, which is an idea that we've talked about quite a bit on the podcast here. So when Rob talks about alignment, basically what he's saying is that in every position, you want to maximize your your posture, your structure, and your base and minimize your opponents. And specifically what he means by that is you want to keep the structure of your your arms and your legs strong. So like we said earlier, you don't want to leave an arm dangling or a leg dangling where it's useless and it's not doing anything. By posture, he means you want to make sure that your your head, your neck, your spine are always positioned in a in a place where you can be powerful and you can't be exploited. And by base, he means your ability to generate and absorb force relative to whatever your goals may be. So usually the way that this manifests is, you know, if your feet are flopping up in the air and they're not touching anything, you don't have very good base. But so many positions involve you planting your feet on the ground. And the reason for that is because by doing that, you have some degree of base. So all Rob is saying when he talks about alignment is that, You want to keep your spine safe, you want to keep your limbs safe, and you want to make sure that you can generate force safely and uh, relative to whatever goals you're trying to achieve. So I think where people get confused when they see Hawking, and I know this was certainly my first reaction, is Hawking is different from a lot of side control positions, the way that you play the bottom, in that usually your legs are pointing one way with Hawking and your body is twisted kind of at like a 45 degree angle to in a different direction. Normally in most classic side control positions, everything's kind of facing the same way. At least that's the way, and again, going back to the old school, that's the way that I was taught to defend from side control, right? Is you want everything facing the same way, and ideally you want to be facing your opponent, but to your earlier point, you can't always choose where they put you. Whereas what is different with the Hawking stuff is you might have your body facing towards your opponent and the legs facing away. And so the immediate objection there is, well, that twist in your spine is going to make it hard for you to generate massive bursts of athletic force. And that's pretty, I mean, you can't really dispute that, right? If you are twisting your spine, you're not going to be able to lift up tons and tons of weight, for example. But the, the thing that Rob says is that alignment is relative to your goals. It's not an absolute. So if you're on the bottom, in bottom side control, you're not trying to deadlift someone from there, right? What you're trying to do is keep yourself safe and have the ability to move and transition. And you don't need a ton of power and strength to do that. And your spine is never in danger. Like you're not twisting it to the point where you're going to get paralyzed. It's like a very slight upper body twist. So after playing with it, I I don't think it really violates the, the principles of alignment. I think it just throws people off when they first see it because they see that spine twist 
and it's so contrary to how they're used to playing the guard. But once you play it, it's like you said, I mean, you're not doing big explosive power bridges from there. So you don't need to have your body facing the same way. You're doing what you said. You're using it as a, a fluid movement position and to keep the various parts of your body safe. So in that sense, I don't think it contradicts any any alignment principles or anything that Rob has said. And I, I understand the alignment in a way. It's easy, let's say, if you do a, like a standing standing, te- let's say technical standup. I, I have right, by the way, I hate that name because it means there's also that not technical standup, but, uh, <laughs> uh, technical standup, you know, it, there are a lot of bad ways to stand up, though, <laughs> yeah, to be fair. but you know, it's why, why it's technical. It, it's like, it's just a standup and there's better ways and worse ways. But I understand that, you know, when you try to stand up, your arm is behind you and maybe even pushing the opponent's head, you know, in that sense. And you have to be strong. So you have to really twist your shoulders. So you, you feel your, your bottom, uh, bottom arm that is behind you is supporting the pushing arm. And I understand alignment in that sense because uh, it makes sense there. I understand. But something is weird when you do alignment, when, like you said, you're in a hawking, like maybe facing the chest towards the opponent, uh, sorry, t- towards the mat, like a running man or facing the chest up more like a hawking. And it works differently. And uh, I would really like to like uh, meet Rob and uh, really just uh, brainstorm with him and uh, just show that, you know, that this is also a line that I, I really, I'm, I'm not trying to be rude in that sense right now, but I really don't, I'm not st- stick, I don't, I'm not stuck with alignment, so I know why it works. And then the alignment theory has to adapt to the hawking because we can test it and it is athletic. So in that sense, because if somebody tries to Kimura me and do everything to me, I can survive there. So we can have to definitely, you know, define athletic, athleticism or whatever. But against somebody who's trying to win, I can hold myself and I can escape. So that means also kind of athletic. So why it would work and what's there? And it would really it would be really nice discussion because I think there it kind of works differently than just as a post elbow post or straight arm post or something like a necktie that you, you know, put your frame in front of the neck and then you stay behind that. So those alignments, they usually make more sense and you can really distinguish, yes, everything is joints are working together. You can push because you're aligned. But then if you, I understand also the freakiness of if you're just laying there and hawking and just like, how is this athletic? But uh, when we do it, it is. And so we have to find a theory that explains that. And definitely we have to test it and everything. So it is... I don't, I, I cannot really explain it also well because the, the common, you know, common, common, uh, feedbacks is like you said, it's, it's weird. It's like, let's not even somebody says it's, it's not purist jujitsu. It's like some twisting. And, but if you watch, uh, but my claim is usually if you watch jujitsu, you don't see much straight lines, you know, you see some elbow posts and in that sense. But mostly you see twisting bodies all over the place if you watch jiu-jitsu. Think about inverts. Think about from side control, let's say somebody does Torando and then you go invert uh, like guard because you want to defend. It's always twisting. And uh, so I'm just pointing out that those twisting positions can stand on their own. And everything is better because if you're flat on your back in a straight line, it's worse. So, and it's, uh, the evidence is interesting. So, and, uh, I, I wish I could, you know, debate more or with people or meet people that want to debate me and we can compare notes and test and stuff because uh, I'm always doubting myself and I, I don't know why it works and somebody should point out when, where, why I'm wrong. And, and so I could fix it. Uh, but so far I'm going with the evidence and the theory is always, you know, jogging behind the practice because the practice comes first. So, and then we learn to better explain it. So I would really interesting in some day to, to meet Rob. And so we can, we can maybe even add something to the alignment stuff and, and why everything works. And uh, so, yeah, so we'll see, we'll see what future brings. (laughs) Interestingly, I think Rob's in a similar situation to you where I think people sometimes take his work and they interpret it themselves in a way that is maybe different from what he intended, because I've talked to him about this. And as far as I know, it's not Rob that is critical of any of the defensive BJJ stuff, but it is often sometimes that people take his ideas 
and they interpret them through their own lens and then they try to apply that to other systems and sometimes they misinterpret it. And the example with with Rob's system, and I mean, it's pretty irrefutable, right? If you if you take your spine, for example, because really with Hawking, we're talking about spinal alignment. That's the part that is controversial, right? I don't think anyone's going to look at Hawking and say your feet are in a bad place or your arms and legs are in a bad place. It's more that people object to the the twisting nature of those positions. <laughs> and there, there's nothing in the alignment system that says you can't twist your spine. It all that all that alignment says is keep your spine aligned in such a way that it is useful to whatever the hell you're trying to do. So an example would be, I mean, if I am on the bottom and you cross face me and you've twisted my head to the point where I I'm basically wedged against the mat, I can't invert, I can't look to face you, I'm stuck. That would be under Rob's system, broken posture, which means broken alignment because you're stuck. Because when you're in Hawking, the important thing is you can still move in the directions that you want to move and your opponent can't really do anything to your head. That's one of the interesting things about Hawking that I would say is probably one of the more um, unique characteristics about it. Usually like with side control, you have to use your hands to protect your face and your head so you don't get cross faced. But one of the unique things about Hawking is you position yourself and you do like a side twist in such a way that you actually don't really need your hands to protect your head. And yes. that frees your hands up to, to hand fight elsewhere. That's, that's kind of the most interesting thing about the position. It's, it's really the only side control position I'm aware of where you specifically don't protect your face. The posture itself makes your face protected. And to do that, you have to twist your spine a bit. And that's where I think people get the chicken and the egg mixed up here. You know, they're thinking like, okay, well, your spine is twisted. Therefore, that's bad. Therefore, you have broken alignment. But that's not really true. You got to rewind the clock back, right? The goal is not to have a straight spine. The goal is to keep your neck safe and to make sure that you can move in the directions that you want to move. Whether or not your spine is twisted is is somewhat irrelevant. Um, There's a lot of positions where you might have a bit of twist in your body. And that's okay as long as you're the one who's doing it and it's not your opponent doing it to you. So there's a world of difference between having your spine twisted because your opponent is cross-facing you versus having your spine twisted because you put yourself into hawking. The difference is if I'm being cross-faced, my posture is broken and I cannot move. I'm stuck. So I'm, I'm getting killed. Whereas if I go to hawking, I still have the ability to move. I still have the ability to turn because my feet are planted and because my spine is somewhat free, I can invert, I can change directions. My opponent cannot lock onto and and cross face my head. So even though there's a twist, you still have posture and therefore you still have alignment, um, at least part of it. But people kind of put the cart before the horse here and they get confused and they're, they're so concerned about whether your spine is twisted that they forget, okay, what are you actually trying to achieve? And what you're trying to achieve is to keep your head safe and to make sure you can turn your body. And you can still do that in Hawking. Yeah, so it's, you know, I, I totally agree that it, it it differs what people are used to it. And uh, and uh, sadly, the upper body defenses are, I have no clue why. Uh, we can clearly say, I don't think I hurt anybody or I don't think it's a word, false claim that upper body defenses, systematic defenses, su- submission and position of defenses are understudied. We have some techniques, I guess, but I even say like um, I would even say like a, like a scattered techniques around and a little bit not upgraded. I even think that leg locks uh, somehow because they're so popular and people are attacking and even leg locks have now better systemized defenses because a couple of years ago we didn't know anything about it and now we have certain like early, late and countering and everything else. But uh, I do, and people are developing that, you know, Instagram is full of those different kind of tricks and uh, setups. But I don't see it uh, towards upper body stuff. It's still the same back escapes. It's still stuff. But and uh, there's, you know, if you if you think about body triangle, uh, let's say there's there really is another good answer against the body triangle. There's some, you know, people are showing things against body triangle. But mostly if you ask somebody, what show me the you know good systematic defense against body triangle. People have some, you know, separated uh, sc- scattered techniques. I can do this, I can do that, but it's hard, blah, 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 blah. And they just, you know, they sometimes even tell beginners that don't use body triangle because, you know, 
it's you, you don't develop your leg dexterity and you know some people should have easier time to escape but just if you can lock the body triangle why not uh, and i don't know why it's understudied or why people don't think there's something there you know against stars anacondas arm bars uh guillotines even positional escapes and somehow we're 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 happy with what we have and then mostly let's say average and then we have people like Tellus. Then we have people, let's say, Carrie Tonon. We have, uh, you know, Gordon Ryan escapes pretty good. And we have, what else? Jeff Glover probably is uh, like a, a really interesting guy to follow and see how he moves. And he just doesn't care. And uh, so the problem is like everybody thinks that, let's say, to take Jeff Glover. Everybody thinks that he's exception. Oh, he's just, he's, you know, that's Jeff. And I actually, I'm actually from the, with with not even with a hype whatever just i think we can all do that and there's a way so i'm not saying i'm there but i i'm already going that way and i can i can teach people to have scrambles and stuff uh, and i can really make sense of jeff escaping so to speak and so my my claim is we can all do that and it's not not taking away anything from Jeff in that sense that, and it's not that hard, you know, doing, knowing what he does is one thing and doing it in a highest level of sport is another, but to explain it, why it works and what it's, uh, how it's built, I think, let's say. So I have my suggestions. Uh, am I 100% right? Who knows? But I can, if I watch his matches, I understand why he did that. And I can, you know, train that and drill that and create those situations. And I don't, I don't consider his style flashy, so to speak, or out of this world. And it's just Jeff. I think it's what he does is very, very, let's say, fundamental. And he has a very great feeling. But the question is, I haven't seen his, you know, DVDs and stuff. That can he really teach everything he does? Because he really has a great skill. So my my concern is that, so to speak, that that people who are great escapers, like Atellas even they're like uh, put aside because oh it's only tell us and then you know that's that's bad for statistics but it's only one guy but then it's a very idiotic answer because that's one guy but it's 100 matches so it's 100 matches you can you know you can see he 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 does those things in a highest level so it's not one guy one match but people see good defense, oh, it doesn't work. And then they find good reasons, oh, but it, with punches, it doesn't work. So, you know, like a, with the moon landing, you know, that if if you tell them, you show the evidence, but they're always changing the argument because their 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 mind is set, so to speak. And even if they say, show me the evidence, if you show them, they find another reason to not believe it. And with the defensive stuff, it's also the same. I feel that if you show the turtle, then that oh, what about punches? I'm, I'm, I actually, I'm not saying names. I'm actually, uh, I have actually been a little bit slapped to the head once when I roll with someone. And um, back in the day, I was younger. And, you know, maybe somebody thought it was a joke, but I actually, I think it was a surprisingly rude that uh, somebody did to me that this, um, I roll with. And uh, when I went to turtle, then a little bit, little slowly, you know, like not like a hard slap, but it was a slap. And they slapped my head because I turned my back and, you know, he wanted to show that the MMA, it would be over. But how is that different from the Mount Bottom? You can slap in the face. It's also over. So, but, uh, you know, that person didn't like the turtle. So he was trying to make a point. And uh, so I think whatever you, you teach them, I sometimes even feel that people don't believe that defense can be that systematic, that it can be an even fight. Like, let's say we see leg locks with a good leg lock, guys, they can have an even fight of attacking and defending at the same time in a very, very high complexity situation. And we can do the same in upper body. But I feel with leg locks, I guess there's more proof and stuff, people competing. And when, I don't know, maybe we see the matches in a high level and then, you know, somebody takes their back. Most cases, somebody, you know, the, the back defender will maybe loses, Yeah. So, but I think it can be also, I really honestly believe it can be an even fight and then sport wins because people make mistakes, uh, tiredness, exhaustion, you know, timing, pressure, strength, everything. That's why athletes are, you know, athletes and they're like monsters. So that's, that's why wins, winning and losing happens. If everybody would go, would go like a turtle, turtle pace, nothing would happen. We need a particle collider that will create sparks. That would be mistakes. 
So we have to push each other. Um, and what I usually, what I don't usually like here, yeah, that uh, that there's no belief that there is a way to you know survive in that sense. So it's a it's a different rant, but it's really close to my heart. And so when <laughs> I also show the Hawkins and stuff, you know, like, a, and then it's like, oh, but this is the twist or it's weird and I don't like it. And, uh, but my argument is if it answers more questions than previous system, then we have to go with that. It, maybe it doesn't answer all, but it's better than before. My, my also, you know, I'm not saying it answers all, but it answers a lot of things. So we should go with that. Does it look funny? Does it look a little bit different than previous what we did? I guess. So what? You, do you have a growth mindset or have a fixed mindset? Let's go with it. We can test it. So uh, so that's also you know what I say to listeners, so to speak, that if you if you watch it, well, the introduction video and stuff, how it looks, I think you can watch competitive matches and you can really compare and see the evidence, so to speak, like you know Richard Feynman said in Nature, compare the nature. And then you you form your system, but, but the nature is leading the innovation because you want to explain nature, not come up with something that doesn't work in the nature. So I think the evidence is there, and uh, facing you know that we talk about Hawking facing them probably in some way objective you know way is better. Facing away is also good, and then you have a jab cross system. It's like a boxing. The jab doesn't work with the cross, and cross without the jab. You couldn't argue that which is better punch because both are good. And so facing away, facing towards, they're both necessary, but flat is bad. So I'm I'm trying to wiggle between that space, so to speak, and uh, to to teach people that why they lose, why they get stuck, uh, and uh, you know why they're not getting stuck. And uh, the running man hawking and all the other other postures are you know, my way of answering the, the question of not giving underhooks, not getting flat, even like escaping to stand up, you know, like a really literally like from side control bottom, like a, who's the UFC guy that uh, Derek Lewis, yeah, he, he has a highlight of just he's standing up from everywhere. I think he has a, a easier time also because the heavyweights maybe and maybe the jiu-jitsu level is not that high there. And also everything is sweaty, but the idea is you just stand up from everywhere. And uh, so that also is an option. That's a you know totally different topic, probably as an esca- escape direction. But that's also how, what all the positions are allowing to do. So you know, then you can choose. You want to be a guard puller. You want to be a stand upper, or something between. So, so yeah. So it's interesting. Yeah, it's interesting how everything works. So and the name. I think or from the name. I think we didn't we didn't talk. I guess I can find in the future. I've said that I uh, maybe I find a new name, but it it all started. And I guess people have to know the the reference that uh, if I say Hawking, then I mean the guy was a genius, and so is this move. So that is the reference that always go with it. So uh, it's a very I guess the dark joke, and I've talked to very smart people about it. And that said, probably gonna alienate alienate some people, and some gonna get offended. But it's it works, so to speak. But also, if somebody finds a better name for it, I'm not stuck to it. So that's that's why we're using it. And uh, you know, the clear reference is it it looks it looks similar, but uh, to the guy. But what I'm saying is, it's not a disability like reference. Is the reference of that guy actually being the genius and this Hawking thing uh, with, with the posture thing is there are as many questions he seems to answer. That's the mount is piling up. It's actually quite crazy. And so the, it's like a, you know, like a tribute a little bit. And the, the guy was a genius. So is this move. So that's always what comes with that. Let me ask a question there, because this is something that I've noticed often comes up when people are learning your system for the first time. Once you're able to resolve all of their questions about, okay, is this going to, you know, is this safe? Where's my alignment? And you convince people that it's effective, then usually the follow-up question seems to be, well, okay, sure, it's fine, but why would I play this? What problem does this solve versus just a standard side control? And I, I think you brought up a good point, which is that upper body defenses in jiu-jitsu don't really have much of a, in the way of systems. I mean, I when I was taught, I was just taught a handful of individual 
side control escapes, none of which worked in a bubble. And it was up to me to build a system amongst them that worked for me. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I'd be curious to get your feeling here when people come to you and they say, okay, you know, I, I think I figured out why this, this Hawking thing works. But the question then becomes, when would you play this versus just playing a traditional side control defense? What Good. problems yeah. would Hawking specifically solve that older school side control defenses wouldn't solve? So again, you have good questions, Steve. <laughs> <laughs> so one way to put it, we'll see how, how how I can use this. One way to put it is Hawking allows every YouTube escape to work because we are facing away, we're facing towards, so the the options are pretty big. And Hawking really allows us even attack from side control with the buggy chokes and stuff. It all fits there. So if I find something that doesn't fit, I will change the system. But so far, I can do, let's say again, most things, 99.9 .9 things from Hawking if I face or facing away. And so it's like you said, you have to build a, your own bubble kind of because you have the separate techniques. But uh, Hawking, the position, uh, it works as a glue. It's like a delivery system. And whatever you like to do, stiff arm escapes, uh, pulling guards, sitting up, inverting, going to turtle, attacking from side control bottom in different ways. It's all there. So it doesn't contradict because the usual problem is with the traditional jiu-jitsu is let's say you do a stuff, uh, let's say somebody top has an underhook cross face and you're there. And then you will see, you know, like, a, let's say you will see a buggy choke. Yeah, we, we know it works. You see a buggy choke, but I, I guess also many people do not teach it. Because it, it kind of also, you know, exposes your arm to side choke if you do it wrong. So it could be like a fringe technique because it exposes a little bit and you have to really be experienced to know. But when you do it in Hawking, it doesn't expose the side choke. I can do it really freely without exposure. So it fits there. And uh, so it, it allows the system, uh, that's the Hawking system, allows me to collect the techniques and to teach everything I want. So, because I hate when I would have a gym, when, uh, when I can't show the working techniques because they they don't fit the system. Let's say even like a, let's say side control, you know, you can have a, you can attack from side control, reverse triangles and stuff in a bottom. If you play traditional side control, those submissions do not fit the system. You can't teach them because you, and also a lot of coaches are saying those are fringe techniques, they're exceptions, blah, blah, blah. And uh, just, you know, and if somebody like a purple belt or whatever, very eager blue belt starts to develop them, usually you get a bad look because it's not the thing you, sh you should be doing. You should be doing your the fundamentals. Don't fuck around, you know, blah, blah, blah. But I think they're wrong. I think uh, when you know the Hawking, you can do everything I, you want because the Hawking is meant to be safe, like boringly safe. Definitely have to fight for a position in that sense. There's usually a fight, a uh, minimal fight, because the posture is strong. And then you can do whatever you want. And uh, that also drives people mad, because what do you mean? You've ever, ever, you can do like sit up this and that, and you have to have like, you know, think about boxing without the body punches, uppercuts and hooks, and your boxing style wouldn't allow them to, to be there. It would be crazy. So Hawking allows actually, if you know, somebody sees the visual like if you face away from opponent let's say if you look look to your left you're facing away and your opponent is your right uh, you can fish with your right leg behind your opponent behind his leg and fish the leg and you know try to pull guard this way there are techniques like this you understand me yeah you can fish like this but with traditional jiu-jitsu when you're flat you can't do it because there's no, somebody has to have a crazy inward rotation from the hips to actually reach behind. But the, the, the way I teach side control, it, it doesn't contradict that. I can, ex, I can explain that escape happening. And it's not a crazy fringe exception flexibility escape. It's part of Jiu Jitsu. And you should know it because as a side control player top, you have to know how they're going to escape. And uh, not knowing that escape is actually making your side control worse, like a top. So, I can make everything like, like a fit there. So the structure kind of doesn't contradict. It looks weird, I know, but doesn't contradict anything so far. And I can show me the system like, you know, Nino Shamri's game. Yeah, kind of like a buggy choke style. 
Nino Shembri's game. I can explain Nino Shembri's game. It fits the Hawking perfectly. You know, usually he grabs around your head, he grabs his leg, you're going to sit up and ends up in a, in a weird scarf hold, kind of different sweeps there. So usually Nino Shembri's game was his game, very specific. There's a Budo Jake, you know, Budo videos clip about that, you know, rolling, whatever. And without Hawking, that system is very hard to teach because you would have to teach the, something on your back. And then how do you go to Nino Shembri's game? It's like, doesn't fit, doesn't fit the traditional side control. So most gyms won't teach it because it doesn't fit the curriculum. It's something weird that Nino developed for himself, but they're wrong. That game is awesome. And I can fit it to Hawking easily. It just fits there like a perfect click. So uh, somehow Hawking as a delivery system allows me to do that. So, and you know, why be there? It's a safe, uh, get bored and then escape whenever you want. Because the first thing is to stay safe and buy yourself time in a certain specific position. You fight for a little bit to map out uh, the top person, what he does, what are his go-tos and how he shifts his weights and stuff. So you can predict, you know, like a uh, build a combination like in boxing in many rounds, you understand how it, they work and finally you start to hit the guy because you understand his, his reflexes. So I can do the same thing basically in a bottom. And then, you know, I can be more kind of more in trouble, less in trouble, so to speak. So Hawking allows me to do that. And uh, what comes to MMA and everything else, there's clicks, you know, certain attachments I use to attach myself to. Ruron Gracie has talked about it. I think if you, if you watch his videos, he's usually on his back. That, that's kind of, I don't like that. I, I would like to, I would in one day would maybe like to talk to him. Why is it? why he's advocating being flat because he could be more on his side and do the same thing. But I guess he's playing even in more dangerous ways. But he's talking, he's showing a lot of things that you can attach yourself to opponent and pull him, pull him even more close to, to you. That is actually very weird to attack because there's need, they need certain slack. So Hawking works the same because I can do a lot of different attachments to you from the bottom that are really like uh, limiting your exposure to different submissions that you can do because you have to kill the attachment first. And that usually comes with overexposure to a certain space and I can use it for escape. So I'm not saying like I, I stay there dead, you know, like a totally dead. And I'm not against the frames, even like in a neck frame and hip frame. I just don't like frames mostly done when I only frame, I think like a typical jiu-jitsu way, like I think like my elbows in front of me, like a frames when I invert, when I bring basically legs over my, my head, that's the only time I use that frame, but I use the neck and hip frame, but I'm usually turning into Hawking and I do it. I, I think being flat and doing them, it's very, very late. And if somebody can use hundred percent of force, it really sucks to be there. And then you realize it, it's not maybe the strongest. And most people are not on their knees anyway. They usually turn to scarf hold and having the cross face underhook grip. So that's also one of the criticism I usually have that everybody shows mostly like, you know, whatever people are uh, higher level people showing against, oh, somebody on the knees. But if you watch matches, nobody's on their knees like this, or they're blocking the hip or something, or they're switching their hips or having cross face underhooks. So sometimes it's weird also whether we're showing techniques against positions that good guys are not doing and maybe beginners are doing. So that's a totally different rant I can have. Uh, but I think I also answered, just to finish it up, uh, my, my part right now, I think I, I hope I answered a little bit that why Hawking? Uh, what does Hawking give me uh, as a delivery system, as a place to be safe? And so the reason why to play it? So I think those would be good reasons, even if you don't like the Hawking, but if somebody hears those reasons, you go like, oh, if that, if such a place would be, uh, exist in Jiu Jitsu, such a position when, when everything you say Preet is true, then I would love that position. So that's the main thing. Do you like or dislike the Hawking structure? It doesn't even, it doesn't even matter. But if I present you those arguments that this is it, and would you do it if uh, there would be a position that allows me to do all of what I said? And I think the obvious answer is yes. And then you just have to change your mind a bit because Hawking looks not pure as Jiu-Jitsu.
at first. It is funny though, because you know, when I I remember when jujitsu first busted onto the scene, everyone said that jujitsu looked stupid and weird, right? And you yes. know what? Then after t- some time, it was proven to work. And that's just part of the evolution. If you're doing something that is different and new, there will always be people who say it, it looks weird or silly or just because it's outside of their comfort zone. I will give you one more example. Like, I don't know how much time we have, but I had also a similar reaction when I taught grilled chicken. When I taught the supine guard, is it the supine or supine in English? I think it is. I think it's supine guard. Supine. Okay. Supine. So I taught this, you know, knees to the chest and stuff. And this was my open guard seminar. And this was very funny because most people were so confused and they were like, they didn't want to actually in the first, I don't know, an hour or whatever, they didn't want to do it because they were like, who plays that? What is this? This is stupid. And then because they were so used to right away getting the arriva, stretching the legs, getting the grips, and they didn't have that retreat position. And then I have to explain, watch Keenan, watch Musumeki, watch Miaos. This is how they keep their guard. And this is the structure you go from, you know, to your guards, different guards. And so uh, somehow people, I don't know, it's weird to say that they don't realize the obvious because we're so, like you said before, we're so technique-based. I don't like technique-based jiu-jitsu because it makes it look so complicated. It's like you, like you said before, you learn different escapes, like 10, 15 different escapes. And then by time, you have to kind of build a system around that, how to make sense of them, how to connect them. And everything. But, but what I do, I teach the delivery system for those escapes. So I'm answering the, the, the stuff that you feel you felt also problematic because you didn't have the delivery system, but a bunch of just random techniques. And by time, you know, by math and everything, by trial and error, you learn to ma- put them together and you develop kind of very your own delivery system. But I'm saying I can like a dissolve that and I can teach that delivery system. So, you know, it you didn't have to do that and those techniques would make sense. So that's why usually what, what's, what my idea is everywhere. Is it attacking? Is it defending? So I'm trying to find those glues, like glue, like a glue, like a, something glued together, not, uh, and the delivery systems. And then people can do whatever the escapes they want because I don't want to interfere with their personal styles. And I want to teach like, uh, you know, like boxing arms up and Philly stance a little bit. By the way, Hawking is actually like a Philly stand boxing defense, you know? Philly, sh- you know the Philly style yeah. like Mayweather? Shoulder roll. Yeah, but this is actually when you see, this is very similar to Hawking. It's actually very funny uh, because it's like, looks also dangerous because, but also it is very good defensive system in that sense. So that's what I wanted to say that, uh, so, and do like it or not, the answer looks like Hawking. So <laughs> that's the fun part. <laughs> Well, Preet, if people want to check out the system, I mean, we plugged it at the beginning, but why don't we do it again? Where do they go if they want to check out your work and they want to join your site? So first, I guess the there's Defensive BGA YouTube. Uh, it's not very active at the moment. We're trying to figure still out how we're going to use it, but there's introduction videos and there's some free videos from my past uh, that when I when it was just my, my site. And uh, so they can check out that. I have Globetrotters. I'm talking about more of free stuff first. I have Globetrotters portfolio. I think there's 20 or something videos there with different seminars that people can see what I do and how I do it. I have a kind of, people say I have a cocky style of being too confident, but, you know, I guess it's the Estonian bluntness. Uh, And uh, I have also good jokes. (laughs) So it's going to be entertaining. (laughs) So then it's DVDs. I work with fanatics. And then it's uh, my recent one. We did it. Uh, it was opened, I think, last year in October. We finally did it at defensivebjj.com, my own site. And I think it was a perfect timing because I have so many like, uh, fans around the world that they're trying and are answering the call, so to speak, that they're, they're seeing there's a problem and they want to defend better. So to work with them uh, more closely, the site has been wonderful. Of course, there's some techniques and stuff. We have homeworks and it's and also it works better if I have a seminars, I can have support through the site, so to speak, to people. So the site uh, has been wonderful and I really recommend people to check it out. It's uh, $15, but uh, I would say 
even the risk is $15. If you don't like it, you can unsubscribe. There's no tricks, but I really recommend without any hype and stuff to really use it for a month and not only lurk around to really use it, to get into feed feedback loops with me, uh, post a video and that's how the site works. And um, so that's my recommendation. And if the risk is only $15, I don't think it's a much risk because even even if you end up unsubscribing and maybe let's say you don't like it, but the video library is already so so big and there's a lot of narrated roles already, so it will be worth your money. Uh, but if you don't like it, people sometimes say, ah, I don't like to subscribe and it's a trap and then blah, blah, blah. Then it's enough free stuff also. Uh, and um, so that's, I think it, that shows also in that people t tend to tell me that it's a good balance, that it's not only behind the money, uh, behind the paywall, but I have also a lot of free stuff that if people want to just check it out and start without subscription and just want to, you know, try things before they, you know, dive in deeper. So both are cool. Both are cool. And uh, so, yeah, so I hope people got something from today. So at least maybe some interesting questions that maybe they never thought about it. Awesome. So defensivebjj.com. If you're a fan of BJJ mental models, I would recommend checking it out. I'm actually on both community discords, ours and the defensive BJJ one. And the crossover is pretty huge. I see yes. a whole bunch of the same people. <laughs> so there's a very good chance if you like our stuff that you'll probably like Preet's. It very much plays in together, especially if you're new at jujitsu. You know, like I said earlier, it it kind of took me till purple belt to be able to put together a good defensive system so I wasn't just getting killed from every single position. And I, I really wish it were possible to turn back the clock and have that stuff sorted out at white belt or even blue belt. So I would suggest, like Preet said, it's 15 bucks. Give it a shot. See what you think. Um, most of the feedback I've seen from our group has been extremely positive. And of course, on that note, I mean, if you want to support us, the way to do that is BJJ Mental Models Premium. We've got a ton of value ads, including our community discord. We also offer premium strategy courseware and I'll review your rolling footage. You have the ability to send me some of your clips. I'd be happy to break it down with the concepts that we've got on the show. The way that you can get on there is premium.bjjmentalmodels.com. Again, if you want to check that out, premium.bjjmentalmodels.com. There's no lock-in or anything. It's a, a monthly thing, much like Preet's. And if you don't want to do that, but you just want to support us financially, you can also make a smaller contribution on Patreon. That's patreon.com slash bjjmentalmodels. So two different ways to support us. I would ask that you consider giving us a shot. Uh, helps keep the lights on, helps motivate us to do what we do. And uh, also give Preet a shot too. It's not going to kill you. You know, for the cost of a private lesson, you could spend an hour with one instructor or you could spend a fraction of that and get both of these services so highly recommend you give them a go pre thanks again so much for dropping by i greatly appreciate you coming by as always and of course to all of the listeners thanks again for all of your time paying attention here and hanging out with us every week and we'll talk to you next time